Good morning. morning. Welcome to Milan Community Church. We are excited to worship together. So let's all stand on up. Great is your faithfulness. Let's put our hands together. Great is your faithfulness. Yeah, you never change. You never fail, oh God. I think we're warming up. Put your hands together. It's okay. The true are your promises. True are your promises. You never change. Cause you never fail, oh God. So we raise up holy hands to praise a holy one who was and is and is to come. Yeah, we raise up holy hands to praise a holy that keep going Hanaho okay um, yeah well um, notice Gary's up here oh you guys may be seated sorry um, we want to pray for Justin our worship director he's not feeling that good right now so just pray for his recovery thank you for Gary uh, stepping in the praise team for adjusting um, so we're looking forward for the rest of the 
music that they'll lead us in. Um, just a few announcements to make. Uh, praise, we got a praise for uh, one of our uh, missionary friends, Leilani. Um, she, is, she got to Jakarta, and even though the COVID restrictions were really tight there. Um, and praise God, she, she, her gallbladder was not infected, um, didn't need surgery, and it wasn't inflamed. So the IV that her husband was putting into her and the antibiotics seemed to help. Um, but they're back in Sulawesi recovering and just resting. So continue to pray for her as she rests and recovers. Um, yeah, so please lift them up in prayer. Uh, ministry leaders, it's about that time of the year. Um, so if you could please submit your 2022 budget to Sean Takahashi no later than September 19th. So no later than September 19th, um, submit your budget to uh, Sean Takahashi. All right, so if you saw the announcements going on, you know that for the youth, August 21st, there is a Nerf war that is planned from four to six. Um, we're gonna go forward with it probably, so pray for that. Um, we'll make adjustments as we need to uh, with the state, but um, hopefully you'll come, youth, and invite your friends. Uh, men's breakfast, prayer breakfast is at the end of the month, August 28th. So there's a sign-up sheet in the back, so please sign up there so we can get our head count. Probably the, the number goes up to only 25 um, with the restrictions, probably. Um, children's Church, uh, we will resume it on Sundays, this next Sunday. So at the 11 o'clock service, Children's Church will be going on. And uh, it will not be going on on Fridays, except the last Friday of every month. We're going to meet here and, and uh, have it here and play games here. Okay, um, and also the Gospel and the Old Testament, Testament, a class that's being taught by Pastor Rick. It will be um, beginning September 29th to November 17th, eight weeks, eight Wednesdays. And so look for the sign-up sheet. It's not there yet, but look for that coming out in the days ahead. And... Uh, that will be a wonderful study of Christ in the Old Testament. Um, let me read, and if you would, turn with me to Psalm 97, before I open us up in prayer. Psalm 97. Psalm 97. The Lord reigns, let, let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightning lights up, light up the earth, his lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the peoples see his glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boasts and worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice. Because of your judgments, O Lord, for you, O Lord, are, the most, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. O you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, all you righteous. Give thanks to his holy name. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us the privilege to gather this morning to worship you as you command that we not forsake the assembling together. Lord, and we want to come to you and acknowledge that you are king over all the earth, over everything, God. No matter in our life or things in the world that seem to be running and spiraling out of control, you are king. And we want to thank you. We want to rejoice in you this morning. Empower our praise team to lead us in songs of praise that would delight our soul and our heart and our minds. Lord, as we worship you, prepare our hearts for your word as it is preached today as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Gary. morning again. I just want to say thank you. Thank you uh, for 
it's so exciting for me to be up here to, to lead worship. And so um, I might get excited. But at the same time, why? I'm excited because there's something powerful about wherever you are in your life or whatever you went through this week, whether it was good or bad. Something about coming to church together to worship God, to hear his word preached, should refuel you, should, should make you and remind you that anything else that you could have tried to fill in to make yourself feel better through the week, it would not suffice. It would not be enough. And so when we come here and we worship the true king who, can, who has overcome everything, he deserves all the glory, honor, and praise. And he's the only one that fulfills. So I pray that we would come together as a church, we would worship him wherever we've come from, and we would sing his praise and remember that he's everything we've ever needed. Let's worship him together. Let's stand up. Mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy
above, enthroned in the Father's love. You're destined to die, but poured out for all mankind. Say God's only Son. God's only Son, the perfect and spotless one. Yeah, he never sinned, but suffered as if he did. Let's sing all authority. All authority. Everything.
never came. Lord, thank you for taking our sin and our debt and our sorrows and our pain on the cross. We didn't deserve you, and you've overcome anything that we can face. So may we trust in you. May we seek you in all things, and may we know that you are king of all. So I thank you for this service. May our worship continue through the preaching of your word. Speak to your pastor, Jason. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Don't know if you heard, but uh, now the U.S. has sent 3,000, now 5,000 soldiers back to Afghanistan. So we need to pray for our, our soldiers, brave men and women who serve our country. So remember them in your prayers. Um, if you would, uh, we are in John chapter 19. If you got an outline, you can pull that out if you want. Let me pray as we open God's word and uh, ask for God's blessings upon our time. Father, thank you so much for allowing us the privilege to open your word, the freedom to do so. And Lord, we do ask that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things here in your truth. As we are in the midst of the trials of Jesus Christ on his way to be crucified as we near the ending of John's gospel. Speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, challenge us, Lord, if, the, if we, are, we have other idols or things that we are trying to build our kingdom of our life with that is anything but you. So Lord, speak to our hearts and change us. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I just read an article about uh, New, Zealand, New Zealand Olympic cyclist who was found dead at age 24. She represented her country at the 2016 Olympic Games and her death sent shockwaves throughout the Olympic cycling community. In a now deleted social media post, she written this, sport is an amazing outlet for so many people. It's a struggle, it's a fight, but it's so joyous. The feeling when you win is, like, is unlike any other. But the feeling when you lose, when you don't get selected, even when you qualify, when you're injured, when you don't meet society's expectations, such as owning a home, marriage, kids, and all because you're trying to give everything to your sport is also unlike any other." End quote. Now I know it was said that she may have struggled with uh, mental health issues, but nevertheless, it was a tragic loss. She was only 24 years of age. As I read her words, I thought about how much pressure she might have put on herself. I mean, any top-level athlete, high-level athlete, I'm sure does. But I also thought about how many people have aspirations to accomplish things, but they don't see it come to fruition. Or like she said, when you don't meet society's expectations, it's rough. Sometimes, perhaps many times, the aspirations that we aim for or the standards that we think we should attain can become idols to our hearts. If we fail to reach them, we can, we can fall apart. We fall apart because that's what we're living for. That's what we banked on for our purpose, for our identity. The truth is, while it may be morally neutral, or even something good like winning a gold medal, owning a home, getting married, having children. Those are, one, those, wonderful, those are wonderful achievements and gifts. They won't, however, ultimately satisfy our hearts. There is only one who can satisfy our hearts forever and, and to the full, and that's Jesus Christ. If we push him aside um, and treasure other things, no matter how good it may be, it means we're pushing aside the only one who can satisfy our hearts. We've all done this. Many continue to reject the truth about Jesus. Many continue to refuse to surrender their lives to Christ. They count their comforts, their job, or traditions in their life to be more value than following and identifying with Jesus Christ. If you haven't yet, turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 19, 
If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. You have, um, I think I have it on your outline there. John chapter 19, starting at verse 7. Starting at verse 7. The Jews answered him, that is, the Jews answered Pilate, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered the headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, would you, have no, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who has delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at the place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to, be, to them to be crucified. So my friends, from this passage, here's our focus for this morning, and that is when you are more concerned about your own kingdom and your own comforts, or whatever, fill in the blank, you devolve into making potentially damaging decisions that carries consequences for eternity. First of all, we see that, number one on your outline, for the Jews, it was really a religious issue. Notice with me verse 7. They believed Jesus should die because of blasphemy. Take a look. The Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to the law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. Ah, so there's the real problem they have. When they delivered him over to Pilate, Pilate somehow got the impression, and which is why he poked at the Jews and he referred to, to Jesus as the king or uh, their king or the king of the Jews. But that would have been a threat to, to Pilate, you know, to have a rival. But after, as we saw, after examining him, he thought, you know, this whole thing is ridiculous. He didn't want anything to do with Jesus. He didn't want anything to deal with this man and this situation. He didn't see Jesus as a threat. But for the Jews, you remember, they accused Jesus of wanting to destroy the temple and then rebuild it on the third day. We know Jesus was speaking, and Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. They thought he was think, talking about the literal temple. They would question him also about claiming, his claims about being the son of God. Well, here it comes out before Pilate. Pilate, after having Jesus beaten and battered and having found no guilt, remember in Jesus, he says he's innocent, nothing worthy of the death penalty. He says to the Jews, take him yourself and deal with him. You want him dead, you do it. And it's at this point, it comes out before Pilate that this is a religious issue, a religious matter. They say Jesus claims to be the son of God. That's why they thirst for blood and they want him dead. He has blasphemed in their view, in their view. They're likely thinking of Leviticus 24, which says this, whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him. The sojourners, as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. So in their eyes, Jesus was making an outrageous claim to be the Son of God. They knew that he was claiming divinity. Remember back in chapter 5, where Jesus healed that invalid of 38 years at the pool of Bethesda? Jesus tells the man, remember, take up, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once, the man is healed. However, rather than rejoicing and being happy for this man and his blessing and his healing, the Jews tell him, hey, it's not lawful for you to carry your bed on a Sabbath, right? The man says, well, the man who healed me, he told me to do that. 
You see, he didn't know who the man was who healed him at the time, but later he found out who it was. And then the man told the Jews that it was Jesus who healed him. And then the Bible says the Jews then started to persecute Jesus because he was doing things on the Sabbath. But Jesus said, my father is working until now and I am working. Now, friends, at that point, they knew what Jesus was claiming. They knew that Je what Jesus was saying. They understood, which is why the Bible says just a few verses down in chapter 5 of John's Gospel in verse 18, it says, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So unwittingly, the Jews say, this guy ought to die, right? We have a law. Well, indeed, Jesus is to die, but not how they see things. They saw Jesus committing the sin of blasphemy. However, Jesus was not blasphemy, right? He was speaking the truth. You can't blasphemy if you speak the truth. Rather, it was their rebellious hearts that rejected the truth. They rejected Jesus despite all that Jesus did to validate his claim, validate his words. To die? Yes. It was ordained and the Father's plan that Jesus die at the hands of sin sinful men. It was prophesied way back, right, in the Garden of Eden. Speaking to the serpent, God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, the coming Savior would suffer a blow, yet it would not be a fatal blow. That is, Jesus is going to die, but he's going to rise from the dead three days later. Jesus said about himself, about his own death, Jesus answered and said to them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to, into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So yes, Jesus is going to die, but he, will not, but he will die not for anything that he's done, but rather he will bear the sins of his people and die in their place. He would die taking their sins upon him. These people knew the truth about Jesus. My friends, they were aware. They saw. They had knowledge of Jesus, and yet that knowledge did not equal belief in Jesus Christ. These guys knew all about him intellectually, yet they were walking and living enemies of God. Jesus didn't fit their ideals. He didn't fit their image of what their Messiah should be like and what he should do and what they expected most of all jesus threatened their religious pride and so-called righteousness he exposed them right he exposed their hypocrisy he confronted them jesus called them out on their hypocrisy he threatened their image he disrupted their life my friends jesus does the same to people today they should, however, consider what Jesus says, that it might actually be true. Now, hearing what they, just, what, what they just said shocked Pilate. Pilate's alarmed. Take a look at verse 8. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. Why, upon hearing this, did it rock the already disturbed Pilate? Notice it says he was even more afraid. Now, John doesn't give us the reason, but it seems to be because of the phrase, the Son of God, that triggered this additional fear. Well, like many Romans, Pilate was likely superstitious and may have believed that Jesus might have been one of the divine men who shared divinity and humanity, or maybe he was like a God or a son of a God in human form. Now, if that's the case, we can understand Pilate's fear, right? He just had him scourged. He flogged him. He had him beaten, even though he was innocent, and he knew it. Not only that, but Pilate's own wife warned him about Jesus. Listen to what Matthew says in his gospel, Matthew 27, 19. 
Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, that is Pilate sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now with that, verse 9, he entered his headquarters again, and he went to Jesus, and he said, where are you from? Where are you from? Now we already know that he knows where Jesus is from in Luke's Gospel 27, 23, Luke chapter 23. So his question seems to be more of, are you from the earth or are you from heaven? Where are you from? But Jesus, notice he gives no answer. Now I don't know why Jesus didn't answer. I don't know if we could say exactly why he was silent here. Could it be that he didn't want to cast pearls before swine? Could it be that he didn't think Pilate would understand or it would take too long to explain? Could it be that he didn't think that that question was relevant? I don't know. All we know is that Jesus remained silent. Now, in just one moment, Pilate became even more afraid. But now, he appears to get upset and angered. Take a look at verse 10. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Now, friends, the to me is, is in the emphatic position here. So it's like Pilate is saying, to me, you're not going to speak? To me, you're not going to speak and answer? I mean, after all, remember, Jesus is the prisoner here, right? Shouldn't, shouldn't he answer a man like Pilate in his position when asked a question? Pilate continues, Do you not know that I have authority to release you and, to auth and authority to crucify you? Again, here we see the, the word authority is an emphatic place. Pilate, in other words, is driving home to Jesus that, that he has authority. Authority I have to release you. Authority I have to crucify you. Authority I have to allow you to live. Authority I have to put you to death. And at this point now, Jesus opens his mouth and speaks. Notice verse 11. Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Not the only sin, the greater sin. Now notice a few things. First of all, Jesus acknowledges that Pilate does have authority as an official representative of Rome. Jesus said, you would have no authority over me. This is why God tells Jesus' followers, right? In, in Paul's book to the Romans, Romans chapter 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. This is why Christians, of all people, are to be known to respect and obey earthly government officials as far as possible. They are in the positions they are in because of God. God sovereignly rules over government officials and ultimately puts them in place. Their authority, according to the Bible, comes from God. This is why the next verse in Romans 13 says this, Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, friends, the authority that God gives earthly powers is not unmitigated and unlimited uh, unmitigated authority. He's ordained government to function a certain way. As the next verses continue, for rulers are not a terror for good conduct, but, for, but to bad. Would you, not, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for, for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. This is the role of government. They are to uphold what is good and hold accountable those who do wrong. 
They are to encourage and promote what is good and healthy and punish those who do evil. God gives them that role. And he gives them the authority also to execute capital punishment, to bear the sword. Now, I can't help but ask, how do our authorities fare? I believe it was in 1962, they banned prayer from public schools. In 1973, the Supreme Court determined that women had the legal right to have abortions as they choose. Just look at the current state of our government or school boards across this country. What do you think? What do you think? What do you see? Do you see good upheld? Are God's moral standards upheld and promoted? Is evil punished or flourishing? Are wrongdoers held accountable or set free? Are our authorities functioning in accordance with how God has designed it or have they abandoned and thus forfeited their God-given authority? I ask you, what do you see? Though God gives secular powers authority and the role they should function in, it is he who gives it. In other words, God stands above all secular and earthly powers. Though earthly government leaders may seem out of control or even function wickedly in this world, we must take heart because our God is sovereign and he still sits on the throne. We must not forget that. And I know it's easy to do it. But he rules from heaven. And through it all, he is working out his plan of redemption in time throughout the ages. Then finally, though God gives secular power authority, yet he still stands as sovereign over all earthly powers, we see that man is still a responsible moral agent here. God's sovereignty, in other words, doesn't negate man's responsibility. Jesus said to Pilate, notice in our passage, therefore he who delivered me over to you has greater sin, greater sin. Jesus is not afraid to call out sinful leaders, especially the religious leaders. My friends, what about us? When we see corruption, when we see, I don't know, bad leadership, to me, putting down the, putting down the greatest country, the United States of America that they're supposed to represent, when you see hypocritical politicians, it's not wrong to speak out as a Christian. We can respect their position, but we can call them out on it too. If they say that we cannot preach the gospel, however, we cannot obey them. If they forbid us to worship, for the church to worship, we cannot obey them. You know, I just read this morning, I saw an article at KHUN2 News about some of the healthcare workers, healthcare workers here, epidemiologists here saying, and they're asking that they close the state down for two weeks or 30 days or up to 30 days. And I thought about that. They go on shut, if that applies to the church, and I'm speaking personally here, talk to the elders and then it's just me personally if they do that and it applies to the church I'm still going to be here Sundays and I'll still preach and everybody can watch on YouTube if they want to that's fine not making any judgment but I'm just telling you that I'm at the point where if it they shut us down again I'm going to obey God and I'm going to come and I'm going to preach whether to an empty room with the audience of one or whoever might be here. But I'm not encouraging you to do that. If it does happen, whatever. But I'm just letting you know, that's what came to my mind after I saw that this morning. Do not forsake the assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. We must obey the God who stands as sovereign over them. 
If they forbid us to speak out against moral perversions like homosexuality, or they try to promote and pass theories that promote and racism and segregationism and separate and divide, or to affirm the transgender lifestyle, we must continue to speak the truth of God in love, no matter the consequence. We're coming to that point, my friends. If not, we're already there. As Jesus said in Matthew <clears throat> chapter 10, Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Earthly rulers have authority, but God has all authority. And Pilate and any one of our secular powers only have their authority because God gave it to them, and they must function in the way God designed, or they forfeit their powers. And though Pilate's actions toward God were sinful here, even greater sin is laid upon the Jews who turn him over. So we're seeing that there is such a thing as greater and lesser sins, right? It may very well be that Jesus had in mind Caiaphas, who's the one who officially delivered him over to Pilate, who had the greater sin. He might also have in mind with Caiaphas, the chief priests and the rulers and those who were there present. What we see from what Jesus says is that there can be greater and lesser sins, but even though God is, but, but even through it all, God is sovereign over them. Sinful man is also held responsible. It's their sins. It's their sins. The Jews were concerned about their comforts that Jesus was disrupting. They were concerned about the temple. But with all their knowledge, they still rejected Jesus. And many of the things that they held dear would, in the end, come to ruin, right, at the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Their decision to reject and call for the Jesus' death had consequences. Throughout our recent passages, we've been seeing the back and forth between Pilate and the, Jew, and the Jews. And here we see it again as we see the Jews said to Pilate and they back him up into a corner. And here we see for Pilate, it was really about job security. It was a job security issue. Notice with me verse 12. The Jews pressure Pilate to give in to their wishes. Notice verse 12. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Again, Pilate knows Jesus is innocent, right? He knows he's not worthy of anything of death, and he seeks to release Jesus. But the Jews back him up into a corner. Something about what Jesus said, something about what he said must have hit a nerve with Pilate, because here we still see Pilate, he's trying to get Jesus released. Yet, there were those who he despised, the Jews, and he feared them, and he didn't want to rub them the wrong way. But he feared Caesar more. Tiberius Caesar at the time was an unstable man, and he was very suspicious about disloyalty among his own, his own servants, his own inner circles. The bottom line is Pilate wanted to have his cake and eat it too, as we might say. He wanted things both ways. To appease the Jews, be in good standing with Caesar, but also release Jesus. He wanted his cake and eat it too, but he couldn't do that. He had to make a decision. Would he be courageous and make the right decision? Would he side with the truth, truth that he obviously knew about Jesus, that he was innocent? No. Here we see that he was more concerned about his position himself and his possessions and he hands Jesus over to them to death verse 13 so when Pilate heard these words he brought Jesus out and sat him on the judgment seat at the place called the stone pavement and in Aramaic Gabbatha now it was the day of preparation of the Passover it was about the sixth hour so Pilate made ready for formal sentencing by taking his place on the judgment seat outside in the praetorium where the Jews were. Now there are two problems scholars have discussed 
here at this passage, and it has to do with the day and the time that took place, that this took place. Some say the day of preparation of the Passover would have been on Thursday. But the problem I see is that uh, the, the Lord's Supper was taken on a Thursday. It, it was called a Passover meal in Luke's Gospel, Luke 22. And Jesus was then crucified on the Friday. Also, the word for preparation means the day when preparations were performed in advance of the Sabbath day of rest, which again puts Jesus' death on the Friday. The other so-called problem has to do with the time Jesus' trial ended. John, notice he says, it was about the sixth hour. Whereas in Mark's gospel, Mark says it was the third hour. So it appears, it appears to me with this apparent uh, problem or so-called problem, the best way to solve it, I think, is to remember that for the ancients, um, time was always approximate. As Leon Morris has said, quote, people did not have watches or clocks. They looked at the sun and they guessed what time it was. Mark's third hour will mean nothing more precise than, the, than, than sometime in the middle of the morning. And John's sixth hour, a time getting on towards noon. In the last effort to taunt the Jews, notice, so those weren't really problems to me. Um, in the last effort to taunt the Jews, notice, notice with me verse 14. In verse 14, notice him, what Pilate does. He said to the Jews, behold your king, right? And the Jewish leaders and those with them, they go crazy, they go nuts. They cry out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And then Pilate said to him, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Wow, in, what, in that moment, Pilate gives in to cowardice to preserve his, himself. But not only that, we see that the moment the Jews speak words um, that mean, you know, we are lowest servants of, they, they speak words, we're lowest servants of the emperor. We only recognize Caesar as our king. We have nothing to do with King Jesus of Nazareth. So for the sake of expediency, they, through their words, they deny God as their only king. As one person has said, quote, so intent were these false and self-serving shepherds on having a, a Messiah of their own making and a righteousness for their own boasting that they rejected the sovereign king whom God had sent. In despising Jesus, they renounced their sacred covenant with God, repudiating the principle at the heart of Israel's life from the beginning, namely, that God is himself king over his people, end quote. They rejected God as their king in that moment. And after that, Jesus was, of course, sentenced to death by crucifixion. God's sovereign plan, the Father's plan, was coming to fruition and it was unfolding just as he said. My friends, we have seen bad decisions here made by the Jewish leaders and those that were with them, along with Pilate as well. They were not better off having made their choice to reject Jesus and not stand for the truth. What the Jews were concerned about happened. Rejection of Jesus, as I said earlier, ended in the destruction of the temple in AD 70, at the very hands of the ruthless Roman master that they played along with here to get rid of Jesus. And for Pilate, his choice, he chose not to stand, right? He chose not to stand on the truth and do what is right. He chose his position, his job, his career, and his possessions. And yet, here's the crazy thing, Three years from this time, he would take his own life. My friends, I ask you as I close this message, who's the king of your life? Are you more concerned about building your kingdom 
Are you more concerned about how Jesus would affect your career, your comforts, your calendar? Remember, the decision you make about Jesus will have consequences, if not now, in time, but it will for eternity. So therefore, choose this day who you're going to follow. Follow Jesus. Through all the challenges, through all the bumps and the bruises, perhaps, through all the heights and the valleys, follow the king of your life. Follow him. Father, Father, we come to you and thank you so much for allowing us the privilege to open your word today. It seems like there are a lot of things that are vying for our attention. Things thrust into our face. Whether it be to fear them or to value things more than the king of the universe. God, I pray you would build a rock-solid faith in each and every one that's here, myself included, to cherish you as our king and to want to honor you no matter what might come. And for any here that have not received Jesus as their Lord, Savior, and treasure of their life who are living their lives for themselves, or maybe just doing the religious motions, I pray today they will surrender their life to the King and that the King Jesus would be in really the King of their lives. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jason. So who's the King of your life? Let's all stand and respond. We
may we come in complete surrender to you every moment of our lives. I pray that we decide to follow you, trust you, and move in no other direction but towards you. I thank you for this day. Lead us through this week. May we bring you worship, honor, and praise. We pray in your name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you.